The events in Hungary revealed the true nature of Soviet so-called peace-loving policies and the limits of freedom. Internally, the party decided to lengthen at least a little bit the leash that the people had grown used to being choked with. The party was a little heady with the progress that had been made and set the goals of drawing ahead of the Americans and attaining communism in 20 years. The party festively declared this generation of Soviet people people will live in true communism. Fear of death and being sent to Siberia gradually dissipated. Prisoners and deportees began returning home in numbers, and the locals were quick to make use of the concessions made in the economic and cultural spheres. People began to grow accustomed to their circumstances. The desire to survive and get ahead became hallmarks of the period. The Soviet army doesn't pursue goals of conquest, it threatens no one. These big guns aren't meant to induce fear. We do say a decisive no to those who intend to violate the principles of sovereignty of states and trample underfoot the noble ideas of socialism. We live and work in the name of a noble goal of attaining communism. This is what our actions and our thoughts are dedicated to. I recall there had been a quarrel between my schoolmate Voldemar Kof and someone else at school, a dyed-in-the-wool true believer in communism, which was a rare thing back in those days. I tried to calm Voldemar down and said, shouldn't we do something to stand up to his kind? He said, for sure, that's what I've thought all along, that's how it started. The first seed was planted. Voldemar said Entarto had talked to him about the same thing. He was in the class ahead of us at the same boarding school. We approached En and brought him aboard as the third person, and that was how the foundation for the force of Estonian youth was put in place. During the fall of that same year, 1956, the Hungarian Revolution began, and that was both our downfall and an inspiration to us. We felt a great deal of empathy to the extent that we could follow events. The voice of America was the basic channel we listened to through the din of the jamming stations. We listened to Hungarian stations and to German language broadcasts. This was the last glimmer of hope that we experienced before the Sovietization of the Estonians set in. We had great expectations, but when hope died in Hungary, it died here as well. Mother died in 1952, and that was where she remained, laid to rest in the soil of that distant village. We returned home after the Khrushchev thaw during the summer of 1958. That was when we were notified that we had permission to return to our home country. We returned, my uncle and I. There were difficulties with securing permission to live here. Settling in the cities was forbidden. The first year we spent with my aunt in Orayue, on the shores of the Gulf of Riga. My uncle applied to be allowed to buy back his farm in the Pernu region. Eventually, after paying all of the money that we had managed to save by selling the farmhouse and cow in Siberia, we bought back our own farmhouse and asked to be allowed to return to our home, the place that we had lived for a long time. During the last year at the collective farm, we were paid 61 kopecks. By now, income had begun to be paid in cash instead of in kind. 
That amounted to 6.1 kopecks for every obligatory day of labor. A one-legged man lived in the next village. He said, even if I were to go and stand on the Tamme bridge and hold out my hat, I'd receive more than half an egg. Back in those days, an egg cost about 10 kopecks. In 1961, there was a currency reform, but that was before the reform. So we were being paid a half an egg for a work day. But how many days of labor did they tally for you? 200 is a rule, sometimes 250 or 300 at best. The year has ended successfully. The Kolhoznik's sit at the New Year's table and congratulate one another on the occasion of the achievements of their work. The village musicians strike up a lively tune. On the first day of spring, the Republic's heroes of agriculture gathered in Tallinn. Comrade Tunorist, Minister of Agriculture of the Estonian SSR, spoke of the achievements of our socialist villages. Well, all of the paperwork for the higher-ups and all of that was genuine stupidity. Orders from above to plant. Why don't you sow? The reporting requirements were completely unreasonable. This was a true circus. The local structure had to report on a daily basis to the district, the district to the region, the region to the republic. Reports on labor and statistics that had to be passed on at five-day intervals. Was this really necessary? That's what happens when administration is centralized. Whatever Moscow ordered had to be passed on to the lowest level within three days. That was a big mistake. It was foolhardy to solve things at an all-union level. Each republic should have dealt with its own problems. The various means provided by the all-union structure were put to use effectively in Estonia, particularly after 1958. As the new year arrived, the system of obligatory daily labor norms was replaced at all kolhoses by a salary system, and the collective farms that had fallen behind the others were converted to state farms. The country folk actively discussed the reorganization of the machine tractor stations. Comrade Kabin, secretary of the Central Committee of the Estonian Communist Party, spoke at the discussions. On the basis of the plenary decision, the transfer of the equipment of the machine tractor stations to the kolhoses will further improve the working arrangements of the kolhoses and help put this equipment to better use. Yes, the stations were broken up. The state and the Russian agricultural system comprehended that the tractor stations had been a burden on the kolhoses due to the price that they charged per hectare, that some kolhoses had been forced into bankruptcy. They ran out of funds for paying the labor costs of the stations. So the tractors and equipment were distributed to the collective and state farms. But there weren't a whole lot of tractors in Mereme and Vostselina County. In the Obinitsa area, we received but two tractors. But the Obinitsa collective farm had 2,000 hectares of land to plow. I'll be damned if that wasn't a tall order. You had to till the fields in the fall because you'd do the cultivation and the sowing of the seed in the spring. But you could also do it in a sloppier way. You would hook up the cultivator and the sowing device and the harrow to the tractor all in one fell swoop. A single pass over the fields, and the land would be cultivated and the seed sown. But that wasn't what you'd call work that was properly done. Doing it that way, weeds were quick to grow. Yeah, 
The entire population discusses the proposals contained in the theses presented by Comrade Khrushchev on how to reorganize the ways in which industrial and construction work are managed. Discussions took place at various shops of Tallinn's machine plants. The boiler makers, among others, agreed that the People's Economic Councils ought to replace the ministries of industry. In the future, the Republic will specialize in the production of machines and devices that don't require much metal to construct. Employee of the Punaneret plant Uno Rinimeri, the 22nd Party Congress inspires us all. We will work to attain the goals of the party program and build up communism. Khrushchev's attempt to give a boost to local initiatives had a beneficial effect on the development of the national economy. People's Economic Councils were established during 1957. The Estonian SSR constituted one district which all industrial production was subordinated to. In 1965, after Khrushchev had been removed from office, the People's Economic Councils were eliminated and the system by which all management decisions were taken in Moscow was restored. Estonia's primary form of industrial activity remained focused on the production of oil shale, which was largely consumed by Leningrad and the Russian Northwest. I'd like to say that the period involving the People's Economic Councils was one of the more positive episodes in the history of Soviet economic policy. A variety of rights that had been previously the prerogatives of Moscow were now delegated to the republics, to the local People's Economic Councils. I had a good working relationship with the Union Republic Ministry of Foodstuffs with a minister by the name of Zotov, a very cultured older gentleman. He was a man of substance and we hit it off well. He helped me solve a whole series of problems. Back then that's how the system worked. If you managed to work with the right man at the right time and had a good working relationship with him, you could solve things. The party altered the ethnic makeup of Estonia as industrialization intensified. Laborers were recruited from the far reaches of Russia. The new arrivals were given housing ahead of everyone else. Long live the fraternal friendship of the peoples of the Soviet Union! Hurrah! 270,000 Russians lived in Estonia in 1959. By 1970, that number had grown to 380,000, constituting 28% of the population. Most of them settled in the cities. The party took pains to cultivate Soviet patriotism and internationalism in the value system of the Estonians and tried to make new traditions take root. Well, there was a fellow named Rein Velja here in Soldino. We'd been in Siberia together. He said, listen, get over here to the Baltic power station. They're getting ready to power it up and need a lot of extra labor. I'll talk to the head of the section. Come on over. We took the bus. The way it worked was, if there were two Russians, you had to speak Russian. And if there were two Estonians and a Russian, well, you still had to speak Russian. So it was just the two of us. We could talk to one another. But as soon as a Russian was present, we had to switch to Russian. So we came on the bus with Yuri. And another man was also there. We joked around and stood in the bus talking. And then they shouted at us, Shut up, you crow! Stop your screeching! Don't you know how you're supposed to talk when there's others on board besides yourselves? Two days went by, and we were summoned to the security police. They wanted to know what we've been talking about. I didn't experience ethnic problems in the collectives where I worked with Estonians. Well, maybe at drinking sessions, but it wouldn't be right to call that ethnic friction. Not, you're a Russian and I'm an Estonian, nothing like that. Still, when all is said and done, I understood that Estonians didn't care at all that much for Russians. This had more to do with the regime that brought people here and not with animosity towards all Russians.
Everyone knew that the standard of living here in the Baltic was one of the best in the Soviet Union. In other republics, the standard of living was lower. People migrate to places where life is better. They came here and regarded it as their homeland, but actually this was the homeland of the Estonians. The system was designed to create a hodgepodge of peoples. The president of the Republic of Finland, Urho Kekkonen, arrived in our republic for an unofficial visit at the invitation of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the Estonian SSR, accompanied by his wife. The president was greeted by chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the ESSR, Alexei Murisep, members of the government of the Republic and representatives of social organizations. The fact that a language is spoken here that is rather familiar to us and reminiscent of home gives Estonia an interesting place in the thoughts of all Finns and brings us closer together. The president of Finland said that cultural relations between Finland and Estonia are vital to both countries. He visited Estonia in March of 64 to lend his support to the Estonian way of life. The price that Moscow demanded for this opportunity to develop relations involved efforts to make Finns stop associating with Estonians in exile. During the summer of 1965, scheduled shipping services between Tallinn and Helsinki were restored at the initiative of Finland and with the permission of Moscow. The traditional procession of warships took place in the Bay of Tallinn. The sailors of the Baltic fleet stand as a wall around our territory. The new situation was quite useful for the arts. This was a new wave. Granted, the earlier postulates remained unchanged as far as the treatment of history was concerned. For example, during Stalin's time, it had been obligatory to constantly emphasize the friendly relations of the Estonians and the Russians throughout the ages. This ancient friendship accompanied us at every step, and everything that had its origins in the West was as bad as could possibly be. This changed now. Even so, some rather formal paradigms remained in place. Opportunities to research the Estonian cultural heritage improved. It became possible to once again research some of the negative and reactionary figures who had been previously banned. It was all right to mention them again, and the tapestry of history became more variegated. The magnificent spirit of the seven-year plan merits being treated by the artist's brush. Mine number eight, a real miner poses for the artist. The artists take this task just as seriously as the work that is going on some meters beneath the surface. The pressure applied to culture lessened. Although some manuscripts never saw print and some plays were banned, the intellectual environment improved, particularly in the visual arts, where aesthetic considerations were once again given their due. Sometimes we put the large constructions aside. What do you think of the figure study? The female nude. The writers of the Republic met for the fifth time. The Congress was opened by the dean of our writing tradition, Friedebert Douglas. Leonid Lenzmann presented the greetings of the Communist Party of Estonia. 
1956, permission was granted to publish the selected anthologies of the refugee poet Suitsenunder. At the same time, the Central Committee of the Party and the Censorship Board Glavlit conducted a thorough search for all forms of expression that might harbor the slightest hint of anti-Soviet thought. A young pioneer of the Soviet Union solemnly swear before my comrades to passionately love my Soviet homeland, to live, learn, and fight as we were taught by the great Lenin, as taught by the Communist Party. <laughs> Why are you joining the League of Communist Youth? As a communist youth, I want to participate in the process of building up our country. While working in the Kukru's mine, Comrade Rubel has shown himself in a manner worthy of those who represent communist youth. He has been an example to others at his place of work, as well as in his social and personal life. It is my recommendation that Comrade Rubel be given the status of candidate for membership in the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. All in favor of the motion? Anyone opposed? No one. There was another development that began to gain ground among Estonians to some extent. We began to see some people starting careers in the Komsomol. That made it very difficult to talk to them at all. They began their Komsomol career path early, in some cases in high school. After graduation, they went on to receive specialized education in this area because special party schools did exist. When they returned, they were posted to Komsomol or regional committees. They no longer differed from the Russians. They would spout propaganda, but they had no other skills at all. I made myself a promise, even if it meant that I would end up digging ditches, I wouldn't join the party. There were all sorts of technical workers who chose that route. There were a number of men who took that path. I don't know if this is to my credit or to my detriment, but in Kehra, when I was building up that plant, there was a need for strong Estonian-minded men, party members, who would be department heads and specialists and able to speak their piece. I was successful in this. I found several good men, whereas I was sure what kind of men they were. I actually guided them into the party and assigned certain tasks to them. You could say that this was a fortunate period. A second thaw arrived. When I started out in grade school, that was during Khrushchev's thaw. That was followed later on by the second Brezhnev era thaw. I was in the middle of my studies when the Prague Spring began. At the same time, the students would arrange processions by torchlight in Tartu. These were arranged by the student government, although the formal term back then was the Komsomol Committee. I think Estonians abroad would have had a difficult time coping with the idea that people joined the Komsomol and were trying to work for the Estonian good. This is, of course, a matter for debate. Was it really possible to do so? Well, in Tartu, I think a sufficient critical mass developed and it was possible. Whether subconsciously or consciously, there were hundreds upon hundreds of university students, even thousands, who all entertained ideas of the Estonian cause in their minds and thought about what it might be possible to do. 
The result was spontaneous, and the most public evidence was in the form of these processions by torchlight. These had very little in common with Soviet traditions. We were visited by correspondents from Komsomolskaya Pravda from Moscow and elsewhere. All sorts of ideological surveillance groups arrived to see what sort of fascist manifestations these were. Was the Baltic area turning fascist again? Moskast vaatama ja igasugused ideoloogia brigaadid saadeti kohale, et kontrollima, et mis, mis fasismiga siin tegeldakse siin, et Baltikum hakkab peale muutama fasistlikuks. Meil nagu Regarding the spirit of the times, we were the first generation to comprehend that, to our regret, there would be no third world war. None of the old men were ready to accept that fact. The old men called us communists when we said this. The Americans would come any day now, the way the Germans had come before and they would help to liberate the Baltic countries. These thoughts helped them to make it through their days. When they did lose hope, they would lose their minds, for much time had gone by. Most of them had served 25-year sentences. Soon after I was released from the camps, the men with the 25-year sentences began to be released, and they were still mentally okay. Ära need mehed, kes olid 25 aastat istunud ja veel hinges ja täitsa normaalse mõistuse juures. Kultsed kuue kõnnendad. The golden 60s, that phrase angers me. The 60s were the years when the resistance of the Estonian people broke. These were the years when the discipline of the old teachers collapsed. They were replaced by all sorts of young ladies who energetically began to apply various forms of stupidity. When I hear this term, the golden 60s, I get really upset. Those were actually the years when our resistance, which had lasted so long, the passive resistance, came to an end. The Sputnik Battalion of the Pioneers of Tallinn's 25th High School came to pay their respects to the servicemen on the occasion of Victory Day. The battalion is given the name the Alexander Matrosov Battalion in recognition of the good training that they have carried out. In January 1968, new leaders were elected to the forefront of the Central Committee of the Czechoslovakian Communist Party. These leaders had as their goals the creation of socialism with a human face, of granting citizens more rights, and the removal of a number of economic restrictions. Events in Czechoslovakia woke people's hopes in Estonia. Perhaps it might be possible to reform the socialist system. Moscow, on the other hand, saw Czechoslovakia as a danger to the entire socialist camp and saw intervention as her prerogative and her sacred duty. On the 21st of August, armored units of the Soviet Union and her satellite countries forced their way into Prague. The Czechoslovak military didn't put up any resistance. The occupation forces remained in Czechoslovakia and all of the reforms were put to an end. There was nothing left for those in Estonia who had longed for socialism with a human face, but to try to reconcile themselves to actual socialism. The system had the army, the organs of repression, and the party as its bulwarks. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the dominant force in society, was an organization of the foreign country that had occupied us, and it had the goal of making our country and people dissolve into Soviet society. By 67, the Communist Party of Estonia had nearly 62,000 members. By 1964, Estonians constituted the majority. The bylaws of the organization said, the party is open to people who are knowingly and actively true to communism.
Party members are obligated to fight against the remnants of nationalism and chauvinism, to remain vigilant and to inform the party in the state of activities that pose a danger. The Soviet regime seemed to be a lasting certainty to both its supporters and those who hated it. There were few who could have accurately predicted that the lifespan of this regime would only continue for a few more decades.